This is Space Time Series 22, Episode 34. Coming up on Space Time, the first detailed results on the Martian atmosphere from the ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter, a Dragon spacecraft destroyed in a dramatic explosion at Cape Canaveral, and the first flight test of the Behemoth Strato Launch Airborne Satellite Launching System. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Scientists have gone through the first year of data downloaded from the ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter. The new findings are reported in two papers published in the journal Nature and a third in the Proceedings of the Russian Academy of Science. The joint European Space Agency and the Roscosmos ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter arrived at the Red Planet in October 2016 and then spent more than a year using aerobraking to transform its highly elliptical orbit into a two-hour science orbit 400 kilometres above the Martian surface. It achieved this by skimming across the upper layers of the Martian atmosphere and slowly circularising its orbit. That was completed almost exactly a year ago. And since then, the probe's been on its primary science mission, which began just over a month before the start of a massive global dust storm that eventually enveloped the entire planet, and ultimately leading to the demise of NASA's Opportunity rover after 15 years of travel across the Martian surface. ExoMars monitored increases in dust affecting water vapour in the Martian atmosphere, important for understanding the long-term history of water on the Red Planet. Spectrometers aboard the probe made the first high-resolution solar occultation measurements of the atmosphere, looking at the way sunlight's absorbed to reveal the chemical fingerprints of the storm's ingredients. This enabled the vertical distribution of water vapour to be plotted from close to the Martian surface up to an altitude of about 80 kilometres, and it included semi-heavy water, in which one of the hydrogen atoms is replaced by a deuterium atom, which is another form of hydrogen with an additional neutron. The new results track the influence of dust in the atmosphere on the water, along with the degassing of hydrogen atoms into space. In the northern latitudes, scientists saw dust clouds at altitudes of 25 to 40 kilometres that were not there before the storm began, and dust layers were also seen moving to high altitudes in southern latitudes. Scientists found the enhancement of water vapour in the atmosphere happened remarkably quickly, over just a few days during the onset of the storm, indicating a swift reaction of the atmosphere to the dust storm. The observations were consistent with existing global circulation models for Mars. You see, dust absorbs the sun's radiation, heating the surrounding gas and causing it to expand, in turn redistributing other ingredients like water over a wider vertical range. A higher temperature contrast between equatorial and polar regions also develops, thereby strengthening atmospheric circulation. At the same time, thanks to the high temperatures, fewer water ice clouds form. Normally, they'd confine water vapour to lower altitudes. ExoMars also made the first observations of semi-heavy water simultaneously with normal water vapour, thereby providing key information on the processes that control the amount of hydrogen and deuterium atoms escaping into space. It also means that deuterium to hydrogen ratio can be derived, which is an important marker for the evolution of water on Mars. The authors found water, deteriorated or not, is very sensitive to the presence of ice clouds, preventing it from reaching atmospheric layers higher up. But during dust storms, water reached much higher altitudes, something that was predicted but never previously observed. The observations clearly show water still exists on Mars, in the form of water ice or as water-hydrated minerals. And of course, where there's water, there may once have been life. To help understand the location and history of water on the Red Planet, ExoMars is now mapping the distribution of hydrogen in the uppermost metre of the planet's surface. Hydrogen indicates the presence of water, because it's one of the constituents of the water molecule. It can also indicate water absorbed into the surface, or minerals that were formed in the presence of water. The probe's mapping task will take a full Martian year, that's two Earth years, in order to produce the best statistics to generate a high-quality map. The first maps produced, based on just a few months of data, are already exceeding the total resolution of previous orbiter measurements. In just 131 days, ExoMars has already produced a higher resolution map than what was possible from 16 years of observations by the Mars Odyssey spacecraft. 
Apart from the obvious water-rich permafrost of the polar regions, the new map also provides more refined details of localised wet and dry regions. It also highlights water-rich minerals in equatorial regions that may signify the presence of water-rich permafrost in present times or possibly former locations of the planet's poles in historical times. The data being gathered by ExoMars is continually building up into a new reference library of shallow subsurface water-rich minerals on Mars. And that's crucial for understanding the overall evolution of the planet and where all the present water now resides. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. Now, while we're on the subject of ExoMars, the orbit has also been measuring trace gases in the Martian atmosphere. Trace gases occupy less than 1% of the atmosphere by volume, and they require extremely precise measurement techniques in order to determine their exact chemical composition. The presence of trace gases is typically measured in parts per billion by volume. So, for example, for Earth's methane inventory, measuring about 1,800 parts per billion by volume, it means that for every billion molecules, about 1,800 are methane. Methane is of particular interest for scientists because while it's often produced through geological processes, it can also be produced through biological processes, therefore making it a particular signature for life. In fact, some 95% of all the methane in Earth's atmosphere is generated through biological processes. And because methane is quickly destroyed by solar radiation in the atmosphere, any atmospheric detection of methane molecules implies that it must have been released relatively recently, although it could have been produced millions or even billions of years ago and simply remained trapped in underground reservoirs until now. The European Space Agency's Mars Express orbiter detected methane on the Red Planet back in 2004, at the time indicating around 10 parts per billion by volume. Earth-based telescopes have also detected Martian methane up to 45 parts per billion by volume. And of course NASA's Mars Curiosity rover, which has been exploring Gale Crater since 2012, has detected between 0.2 and 0.7 parts per billion of methane by volume, with some seasonally higher level spikes. And of course, just last month we reported that Mars Express observed a methane spike just one day after Curiosity's highest level readings. The new results from ExoMars provide the most detailed global analysis yet. However, it's only detected an upper limit of 0.05 parts per billion by volume, some 10 to 100 times less than any other observations. The most precise methane detection was around 0.012 parts per billion by volume at an altitude of 3 kilometres. Mission scientists admit that ExoMars' high-precision measurements seem to be at odds with other observations. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. The first Crew Dragon 2 capsule, which successfully flew to the International Space Station in March, has been destroyed in a major explosion at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. Witnesses say there was a deafening blast followed by billowing clouds of orange smoke rising up from the test stand at the landing zone 1 pad. Both NASA and SpaceX are describing the incident as an anomaly which occurred during a ground static fire test of the capsule's launch abort system. The system's designed to shoot the capsule away from the Falcon 9 launch vehicle in the event of a catastrophic failure during the launch or ascent phase of a space mission. It seems initial tests of the system were successful, but then a final test resulted in the anomaly on the test stand. Reports suggest the explosion occurred as the capsule's Super Draco thrusters, which are used for launch abort, were armed to fire in flight-ready configuration. The focus of the upcoming accident investigation will undoubtedly centre on the hypergolic propellant thrusters' high-pressure fuel tanks, the propellant lines, their valves, and associated avionics. Hypergolic propellants are designed to ignite violently when mixed. This same capsule was to be used for an emergency ejection test next month, but the incident has forced both NASA and SpaceX to postpone that test, and to postpone the Crew Dragon 2's next mission, which was slated to take two astronauts to the International Space Station on a test flight in August. The Dragon 2 capsule, together with Boeing's CST-100 Starliner, are being developed under a NASA commercial crew contract to provide crew transport services to and from the International Space Station. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time.
Strato launch has successfully undertaken the first test flight of the company's behemoth twin fuselage six engine jetliner designed to launch satellites into space from high altitude. The massive aircraft remained airborne for two hours after taking off from the main runway at the Mojave Desert's Air and Space Port, some 112 kilometers northeast of Los Angeles. The Strato launch is designed to carry as many as three satellite laden rockets at a time mounted between the twin fuselages under the center span of its enormous 117 meter wide wingspan, the largest wingspan of any aircraft in the world. Once in operation, Strato launch will climb to an altitude of around 10,700 meters, that's 35,000 feet, before releasing its rocket payload, which will then ignite its own engines and quickly soar upwards into space. A similar system is already being used by Virgin Galactic to launch its Spaceship 2 rocket-powered space plane from its twin fuselage mothership, the White Knight 2. And Orbital Sciences has also used a similar system to launch its Pegasus rockets from beneath the belly of a specially modified L-1011 Lockheed TriStar airliner. Strato Launch was originally planning to develop its own rockets for the program, but it will now use the proven Pegasus booster instead. The Strato Launch aircraft was built by Burt Rutan Scaled Composites at the Mojave Airport. It began ground tests and taxing back in May 2017. The aircraft is powered by six Pratt & Whitney PW4000 jet engines sourced from two used Boeing 747-400s. The engines are each rated at between 46,000 and 66,500 pounds foot worth of thrust. The aircraft's twin fuselages are a massive 72.5 metres long. It has a maximum takeoff weight of some 1.3 million pounds, that's 589,676 kilograms. That's just slightly more than the Airbus A380-800F, but well below the 640-ton maximum takeoff weight of the Antonov AN225 Myra. By comparison, a Lockheed C5 Galaxy can lift about 512 tons, the Boeing 747-800, 442 tons, the Antonov AN124, 405 tons, and the Boeing C17 Globemaster, around 265 tons. And time now to turn our eyes to the skies and check out the celestial sphere for the month of May on Skywatch. May is the fifth month of the year in both the Julian and Gregorian calendars. The month is named after the Greek goddess Maya, who was identified with the Roman-era goddess of fertility Bernadia, whose festival was held in May. More importantly, for many of our listeners, May typically marks the start of the summer vacation season in the United States and Canada. Although for us south of the equator, it means colder weathers are coming. Okay, let's start our tour of the May night skies by looking east, where you'll find the constellation Scorpius the Scorpion. In Greek mythology, the constellation is named after Scorpius, who was sent to Earth by the goddess Sky to slay Orion the Hunter, after he boasted that he could kill all the animals on Earth. Scorpius stung Orion in the shoulder, but Orion's life was spared by Ophiuchus the healer, and he was placed in the heavens along with Scorpius, who would continue to pursue him for eternity. So, Orion the Hunter has become the hunted forever, with Scorpius rising in the east this time of year to triumphantly chase and defeat Orion, who sets in the west. And so, this story plays out year after year. The brightest star in Scorpius is Alpha Scorpi, or Antares, the scorpion's heart. In ancient Greek, Antares' name means the equal or rival of Mars, the god of war. That's because its golden orange appearance is very similar to that of the red planet, and it passes very close to Mars every 780 days. Easily seen with the unaided eye, Antares is some 550 light years away, but it looks so incredibly bright because it's around 57,500 times as luminous as the sun, and it's one of the largest known stars in the universe. A light year is about 10 trillion kilometres, the distance a photon can travel in a year at 300,000 kilometres per second, the speed of light in a vacuum, and the ultimate speed limit of the universe. Antares is a red supergiant. It's about 18 times as massive and 883 times as wide as the Sun. In fact, were it placed where the Sun is in our solar system, it would engulf all the terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars, and its visible surface would extend almost as far out as Jupiter. Astronomers think Antares began life about 12 million years ago as a spectral type O or B blue star. And like the similarly sized red giant Betelgeuse in the constellation Orion, Antares will almost certainly end its life as a spectacular core collapse or type 2 supernova, 
probably within the next few hundred thousand years. When it does explode, it'll appear as bright as the full moon for several months on end and will be clearly visible in daytime from here on Earth. Antares is a companion star Antares B, located between 224 and 529 astronomical units away from the primary star. An astronomical unit is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, which is about 150 million kilometres, or 8.3 light minutes. Spectral analysis of Antares B indicates it's pulling a lot of material off its bloated red supergiant companion. Located just near Antares is the M4 globular cluster. Easily seen through a small pair of binoculars, M4 is located some 7,200 light-years away, making it one of the nearest globular clusters to Earth. It's a tightly packed ball made up of a million or so stars, originally all born at the same time through the collapse of the same stellar nursery some 12 billion years ago. Located near the tail of Scorpius the Scorpion are two open star clusters, M6 and M7. Open clusters are loosely bound groups of stars, which were originally all formed at the same time in the same molecular gas and dust cloud, but are not as densely gravitationally bound as globular clusters. It's thought open clusters generally survive for a few hundred million years, with the most massive ones surviving for maybe a few billion years. M6, which is also known as the butterfly cluster, is some 12 light years across and located about 1600 light years away. It contains about 80 easily identifiable stars, which are all less than 100 million years old, which is young in cosmic terms. M7, or the Ptolemy Cluster, is named after the ancient Greek astronomer and mathematician Claudius Ptolemy. It's about 980 light years away and is far more dispersed than M6, covering an area of 25 light years. And at 200 million years in age, M7 is about twice as old. By the way, the M in terms like M4 or M6 or M7 are all abbreviations for the name Messier in honour of the 18th century French astronomer Charles Messier who developed an astronomical catalogue of fuzzy nebular objects in the sky. See, Messier was a comet hunter who compiled a list of 103 fuzzy objects which weren't comets and so from his perspective could be ignored. Later on, other astronomers added additional celestial objects to the list, bringing the present day catalogue up to some 210. One of the highlights of the May skies is the annual Eta Acrid's meteor shower, which is generated as Earth passes through the dust and debris trail left behind by Halley's Comet. Comet P1 Halley is a well-known short-period comet which visits the inner solar system every 75 to 76 years. The 15-kilometer wide mountain of rock and ice will make its next close-up appearance in 2061. It's named in honour of the British astronomer Edmund Halley, who in 1705, after examining ancient Chinese, Babylonian and medieval European records, successfully predicted its return in 1758. Sadly, however, he died in 1742, before his prediction could be confirmed. He is, however, immortalised for his work by having the comet named after him. Halley's Comet has a highly elliptical and elongated orbit, which takes it from between the orbits of Mercury and Venus out almost as far as the orbit of Pluto. Halley's orbit is retrograde, meaning it orbits the Sun in the opposite direction of the planets, or clockwise from above the Sun's north pole. Its retrograde orbit results in it having one of the highest velocities relative to Earth of any object in our solar system, some 70.56 kilometers per second, or if you prefer, 254,016 kilometers per hour. As well as the Eta Aquarids meteor shower every May, Halley's Comet also produces the Orionids meteor shower in late October. Astronomers think Comet Halley was originally a long-period comet, which took thousands of years to travel to the inner solar system from beyond the Kuiper belt, possibly even as far as the Oort cloud, but was gravitationally perturbed into its current orbit through a series of close encounters with the outer giant planets. The Eta Acrid's meteor shower runs from the 19th of April through to the 28th of May, with around 55 meteors an hour, making it one of the Southern Hemisphere's best celestial showers. However, back in 1975, the Eta Aquas were running at 95 meteors an hour, and in 1980 it was up to 110. Even better, the bright yellow meteors often appear as streaks known as trains. They radiate out from the direction of the constellation Aquarius and the star Eta Aquarii, hence the shower's name, Eta Aquarids. Just look east after midnight and before dawn for the best view. And now Jonathan Nally, editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, joins us for the rest of our tour of the May night skies 
on Skywatch. G'day Stuart, well look it's heading into winter now for us down here in the Southern Hemisphere, although I have to say from uh, where I am in Australia it hasn't seemed like winter at all lately, um, although it is getting, the nights are getting darker earlier, so... Uh, yeah, Australia really... doesn't really have proper winters, does it? Well, not compared to other places in the world, let's say, yeah, so the Northern Hemisphere... It's climate. not like New York City in winter. <laughs> well, or like Chicago. or Chicago or any of the Scandinavian countries or <laughs> Russia or China or Mongolia or anything like that. No, we don't really get... Um... How do we get onto this? Winter. Okay, so winter, yes. Yeah. So the, the nights are starting to get longer now as winter's coming along here in the Southern Hemisphere. That's good because uh, it gives you more hours of night time to do stargazing. It, it's bad because it's cold, but no, that's what you have to put up with if you want to be a stargazer. But it looks really good and lots of great Southern Hemisphere-only constellations are visible for us lucky people down here in the south, such as the Southern Cross, the one everyone wants to see. Very often when we're having these chats, I say, I have, I'm forced to say, well, the Southern Cross is upside down at the moment or it's flying on its side or whatever, but coming into winter, it's standing upright, nice and high in the sky. You can't miss it. Pretty small constellation, but prominent stars down in the south. To its left, just a little bit over to the left, are two bright stars close together. They're called the two pointers, Alpha and Beta Centauri, and they point in inverted commas, towards the Southern Cross. To the other side of the cross, across to the right or, or west, are the constellations Carina, Vela and Puppis. These are the ones that used to be one big constellation called Argo Navis, and they got broken up years ago, and these are full of fantastic star fields and nebulae, because you're looking into the Milky Way galaxy, our galaxy, when you look into this part of the sky. So if you've got a pair of binoculars, even little ones, they don't have to be huge ones, uh, grab them and take a look through the Milky Way down south. Uh, you see all sorts of stars and stuff. It's fabulous. And the bigger your binoculars, or if you can get into a telescope, the more you can see. You know, you see star clusters and nebulae and, and dark, dark clouds in the uh, Milky Way. It's just brilliant. Over to the west at this time of the year, um, and you've, you have to be quick to catch it because Orion, the hunter, is still up over the horizon, the western horizon, after the sun has set. But as each day goes by, it's getting lower and lower. Nearby to Orion, you've, you've got Sirius, the star we mention quite often. It's the brightest star in the night sky in the constellation Canis Major. And a little bit further north of Sirius is another bright star called Procyon. That's in the constellation Canis Minor, the smaller dog. Up in the northern half of the sky, for us down here, say, in Australia, northern half of the sky this time of year seems fairly devoid of bright stars and things, but there are some really famous constellations there. You've got Leo and Cancer and Virgo. Virgo is a real favourite of amateur astronomers because if you do have a telescope, you can see hundreds and hundreds of galaxies, so big galaxy clusters in Virgo. You can't see them with the naked eye, you would have no idea. But when you get a telescope onto it, you can see all these galaxies and they're just amazing. If you've got a small telescope, they'll just look like tiny smudges of light. You might even have to sort of look at them sideways so you're not looking directly, the light's not coming directly onto the middle of your retina where your uh, eye isn't quite so sensitive, but just off to the side where you've got the more sensitive part of your retina. That's called averted vision. And at a bigger telescope, you can see stacks of these uh, galaxies. In the mid-eastern part of the sky during mid-evening, we've got Scorpius is poking its head up over the horizon. Scorpius is one of the only constellations that looks like its name the scorpion, right? You've got the southern cross, looks like a cross. You've got triangular, which looks like a triangle. And Scorpius really does look like a scorpion when you when you sort of trace it out and join the dots of these stars. And just near Scorpius, we've got Sagittarius. And we're looking towards the Sagittarius part of our Milky Way. We're looking towards the centre of our galaxy, which is, which is pretty amazing. If you can get in your mind when you're out there at night sky, get in your mind this sort of 3D effect. Forget you're standing on a planet. Just think you're floating in space and that you're inside this galaxy. It really, it's sort of, it's making science fiction become real. Now, what about the planets? It's as far as planets go, the only one visible in the early to mid-evening, right now at least, in May 2019, is Mars. And Mars is low in the northwest and looks just like a sort of an orangey red star, about medium brightness. And uh, you, you, you've only got about an hour or so before it gets um, below the horizon. So if you've got a nice clear eastern, sorry, western sky, get out and have a look. You'll see a medium brightness reddish sort of star. That's, that's Mars. At about half past eight over on the other horizon, the eastern horizon, Jupiter will be coming up. Now, this is a really good time to see uh, this planet. And next month will be even better because Jupiter comes to what they call opposition in June. Opposition is when a planet is seen in one direction in the sky and the sun is 180 degrees directly opposite in the sky. So Earth's in the middle and the sun's on one side and the planet's on the other. And what this is good for means when the sun is setting in the west, 
that planet is coming up in the eastern sky and that means you've got all the hours of night time to view it. I mean, I said a moment ago that Mars is already in the western sky, so you've only got an hour or so after the sun goes down until Mars sets and that's it for Mars for the night. When you've got a planet at opposition, it is up all night basically. So even though opposition is next month for Jupiter, this month May is perfectly fine. The planet's going to be up for almost all of the night. So give it a try, have a look. You should be uh, really impressed, particularly if you can get a telescope onto it. You can see the cloud bands, maybe even the great red spot. And even with binoculars, you can see four of the moons, the Galilean moons, the ones that Galileo spotted. Now, following Jupiter up over the horizon about an hour and a half later is Saturn. Now, Saturn isn't quite as bright as Jupiter, but of course, it has its famous rings. Now, you're not going to see much through a pair of binoculars with Saturn's rings, but if you do get a chance to take a look through a telescope, do so, because at the moment, the rings are tilted at almost their maximum tilt as seen from the Earth. Just because of the orientation, it's not that the planet itself is changing its tilt, it's just our orbit is in a sort of slightly different plane to Saturn's orbit. So sometimes we, from our vantage point on Earth, just like, like a line of sight effect, sometimes we're seeing the, the rings tilted quite a lot to us. Other years, the rings appear edge on and they seem to disappear. So that's usually considered not the best time to see Saturn because you're missing the rings. So right now, with the rings almost at their maximum tilt, get out and have a look through a telescope if you have one or a friend's got one. Best time to see them. Yeah, yeah, good time to see them. So uh, moving ahead through the night time now to the morning sky, we'll have Mercury and Venus, the two inner planets. Now, these two planets being on inner orbits compared to the Earth, closer to the Sun, are always seen not far from the Sun in the sky. So that means they're either above the western horizon after sunset or, as now, they're above the eastern horizon before sunrise. At the start of May, Venus, the brighter of these two, will be rising first, about 4.30 in the morning, with Mercury about half an hour later. But you're going to have to be really quick to catch Mercury this month because it's getting lower and lower in the sky each day and by about... May the 9th, it will be too low in the sky as the sun's coming up and you won't be able to see it and it's going to become lost in the glare of the sun because it's going around the other side of the sun at the moment which is called superior conjunction and it won't come back for a few weeks at which time it will pop into our evening sky out in the west after the sun has set. And that, Stuart, is what we can expect for May this year. That's Jonathan Nally, editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 